Why? Because the bride of Yeshua Moshiach is the one that has grown up as a believer in a relationship with him and has learned to trust him. What every hand, his hand may give. And here we see a progressive, detailed explanation of growing up in our relationship with him. It is detailed. And we said for our study in the Song of Solomon, we're going to, we're going to focus mainly on the three different loves that we find here and how they connect with one another. And here and there we, we do some study round about the verses in those eight chapters that has to do with the love, just to, just to uh, amplify it and to, so that we can understand it a little bit better. So let's close our eyes and before we start with our study. Lord, when we talk about the Song of Songs, the Song of Solomon, the song that the one will sing who has learned to rest, to have peace in your hands, to rest and to trust your sovereignty. We pray as we study this, these few chapters, Lord, that you may open each one of us Open our spiritual eyes. Give us a desire to have greater insight, greater sight in each one of our own circumstances so that we may see and know within the circumstance that I am in where and how you want us to trust you, to rely on you, to lean upon you, to depend upon you not to fulfill the outcome that we want, but to trust in your character irrespective of the outcome. Because that is what, is what faith is called. That is called faith. Thank you, Lord, that you explain to us this relationship in so much detail. And we pray that each one of us will find the connection in our relationship with you as we study these instructions that you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we have already said, there are four covenants. You will see there even in the study on the, on the tabernacle, mosaic tabernacle, we'll see there at the Ark of the Covenant. You see, that's where the judgments, we will find the judgments and the covenants. You see it. Unfortunately, I cannot back it up at this moment with a study on that, but that is just scripture that we've written down there. Covenants. So, this Song of Solomon can only be sung if we progressively uh, grow in these four covenants. We said the first covenant that we find in Hebrew, in Hebrew history, the first covenant is called the covenant of the servant. I'm not going to go into detail now. I've done it a few weeks ago. First covenant is called the covenant of the servant. When we become servants of the Most High. How do we become servants of the Most High? By going through the blood covenant. Blood and blood is, uh, bread is broken and blood is drunk, uh, drunk uh, to substantiate or to announce that relationship of a servant. If we understand the whole principle of covenants, we will understand that the covenant can never be broken. Whoever breaks the covenant 
Both parties are, are responsible. The contract of the covenant is set out in the Ten Commandments. If the contract of the covenant is broken by me as a human being, then that's part of the covenant, then the curses come upon me. If I follow, and my intention is to follow the, the covenant that is summarized in the Ten Commandments, I don't do the commandments to please Him. Because I love Him, I follow the commandments in this relationship. Completely something different. Then I walk and live under His blessing. Then, the second covenant which is built on the first covenant, each covenant is just a progression of a relationship. The second covenant talks about the friendship covenant. Now when people got married, I must just say this, when people got married, they had to go through all four of these cups of wine and bread covenants that they must partake, both parties. So the second covenant is the salt covenant, salt covenant, was uh, e uh, eaten together with the bread and the wine because salt was a indication or a symbol of loyalty and friendship. The second covenant, more surrenders was given. All right. That's where we find the word faithfulness as well. Faithfulness, the root word of that is faith. Then the third covenant is the covenant that Jesus spoke to Nicodemus about in John chapter 1 verse 12, where he said, uh, whosoever receives him, receives power to become the sons of God. So the moment that we've gone through the first covenant, then he says, uh, and the second covenant, he says, there, trust and faith he uh, grows, grows, trust and faith grow to the point of the third covenant, which is the salt covenant. The, uh, in, uh, the third covenant is called the covenant of inheritance. Okay. And the color in the, in the word of God that goes along with it is blue. Blue in the Jewish culture was domination, royalty, governance. Let me just draw it for us. The four square name. Yud, hey, va, hey, right. Here we find the first covenant, the blood covenant of servitude. Servant. The color there was red. Then the salt covenant. Every time of uh, wine and bread you can, is, is used as well. And here we get salt added to it. This is called the friendship covenant. And the color here is yellow. And the third covenant is the inheritance. where we find the sons and the daughters. Sons and daughters, here we, uh, it is called the sandal, covenant of the sandal. Sandals, D-A-L. Sandal, covenant, and this is blue, the color here is blue. And then the fourth covenant is called the covenant of the white dress. White is the color here, and it is the wedding. And all of these covenants 
Well, it doesn't matter what situation you are, what relationship type of relationship you have with the Lord now at this moment. His light, the Father's light is shining upon us, whatever situation you are in. His white light. Light, the color of light is white. How do we know that light consists out of seven colors? We take a prisma or a prism. We shine white light, light into it or through it. And coming out on the other side, light is broken. Got a, uh, 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 what do you mean South African index? Bendings. Bendings index. And the more the light is broken, uh, it runs from color one to seven. The seventh color is the one that is broken the most. And this is you and me, I. Here you can draw a prism. God's light comes. What light, what color do we, ref what, co what color are we aware of when we look at the different colors? Is that object absorbs all the white light and the, the color, the, the frequency of light that he reflects is what gives the color to the, to the object. So God's light is shining here upon us now. And if you absorb everything for self, you are dark. That is where dark or black comes from. It absorbs everything for itself. In the Bible, it's explained as blindness and having no understanding. God's light shines upon everybody and most people just absorb it. And therefore, in the spirit world, they've got no light that reflects and they are dark with no understanding. The light that we reflect is in the amount of a relationship that we have, the type of relationship that we have that is explained through these covenants. We see a lot of this reflected in the study of the Song of Solomon. That's why we bring this in. So the spirit world sees us and they recognize exactly where you stand with God by just looking at the color that is reflected around us. Amen. We are either reflecting red and yellow and blue All right, and here, what do we find here? To make up the full spectrum of light, red and yellow, here is orange, yellow and blue, here is green, blue and red, when that is mixed, you get white or you get purple. Is in this area, if we can try and diagnose an area where God and you have and develop and grow into a bridal relationship. None of this are specific, which you can understand. You're not one day here and the next day there, because it is uh, surrenders that we make as he brings different circumstances over our pathway. Okay. Right. I've tried to explain a little bit of this every time so that we can get more and more detail of what he said. Now, uh, all of these different covenants has to do with Rest. Resting in Him. I think I said last week that the kingdom of heaven, when Jesus said the kingdom of heaven has come near you, 
He said to the disciples, go and preach and say the kingdom of God has come near you. The kingdom of heaven is near to, him, um, to most people. But they haven't entered it. You enter it through born, to be born into it. Okay. Then, the kingdom message is one of Shabbat, rest. Okay. So each one of these corners that God puts us in, circumstances that God puts us in, different circumstances, is so that I can learn to find a place of rest and trust. Because rest is not passive, rest is active. It means I actively are surrendering my mind, my thoughts, my reasoning, my feelings, my worries, my anxieties, my fears, I actively put before his feet cons constantly and consistently until that is laboring unto rest that Hebrews chapter 6 or 4 talks about that I referred to last week where he says labor into that rest until you find rest and that talks about the progression of our relationship with him okay so, we've, what we've done, we've done song, uh, song of Solomon. Sorry, the Song of Solomon in my Bible. I've written so many notes in here through the years. I'm taking this little Bible of mine. And I've highlighted some scriptures here for our study. Song of Solomon, in chapter 1, verse 2. We read there about, as we said, we're going to focus on the word love that we find in the different chapters. He says there, uh, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. I've explained that. He talks there about D-O-D-E, doed love. Right, so he says, this new excitement, after I've been born again, after I've experienced his salvation, if I grow in my relationship with him, I come to a point where, where I realize but there's more to this than what I've experienced. There's a relationship, an active relationship, and there's a, 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 I am in a position of being fertile by his word. I am the womb, and he is the bridegroom with his male word that wants to make me, uh, to impregnate me with his word so that new life can be brought forth, can be birthed through me. And she says here, she's got butterflies on her stomach because she now realizes that this is a progressive relationship. Now, dear saints, what I'm saying here is news to the whole Christian uh, religious world. In the sense that many times Christians do not realize that to be saved and born again is just the beginning of a great, a great event, a great a relationship that needs to progressively grow and they do not realize that there's a whole plan that God has set out of how to grow in our love with, for him and how can I experience his love more and more in my life this is what she says here, that's why she uses that word uh, uh, love there, D-O-D-E don't love alright, then she says here uh so she says here, let him kiss me. And we said last week, I'm just doing a short revision, uh, kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. And we said that refers, if you look at the Hebrew, she says, kiss me with your living word. Because we said kissing stirs love in your bowels. Physically and spiritually. So a good prayer to pray continuously is say, Lord, kiss me with your word. Cause my innermost being to turn and to start having butterflies inside of me because I start to listen and hear your voice in the midst of reading, you know, while I'm reading your word, while I'm reading the Bible, 
I presume you experience it when you read the Bible. Something jumps up in you because you experience that there's something more happening in you than what just meets the eye, just the letters in the Bible. So that way he kisses us or touches us. And when that's what we need, that's why we need quickened word. We need word that has been made alive. How does it make, how does it become alive? When I allow him to kiss me. And, I'm, and if I have a desire for him to kiss me. Right. Then verse 4. We're just doing some revision. Draw me. We will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than wine. The upright love thee. We find the word love twice there. Okay. And two loves. First love, D-O-D-E, dod. And the second love, ahap. Love that he refers to here too. Uh, he refers uh, to those two types of love. And uh, we've had a look how he draws us. We had a look at what the Hebrew means. When we say draw me, and God uses any means to draw us. Any means. He'll use your child, he'll use your wife or your husband, he'll use your friend or your enemy, he will use circumstances or your finances, he will use your health, any way he will use any way. Any means. To get your attention, when you start praying and say, draw me. We've learned what that word draw means. It means all these that I've said, that I've mentioned, and even more. All right. So, uh, he says, Thou hast brought me into thy chambers. Now, the moment that we get saved, things definitely doesn't become better for us in our circumstances. Ask me, after I got saved, I was charged uh, by the squatter law. I got a, a gedag vader, what's it now in Engels? I received a summons. In the old, it was in the old South Africa, a summons that I need to um, evacuate that room as quick as possible, otherwise I would be persecuted. So that's just after I, I, I got saved, got reborn again. Then I had to look for another place to stay. But God does that many times so that he can get you moving. Start moving. Sometimes you need to move physically, and that's just sometimes to get you from one way of thinking to another way of thinking. He, needs, he uses many things to push us and to draw us, to get us away from the issue that we are focusing on now. Right. And therefore, those chambers can be explained through this four-corner this four principle. Different chambers, poor corner, uh, stranger corner, fatherless corner, widow corner. As we've explained those type of circumstances through time. Right, so that's when he draws me. Uh, he brew, draws me into a specific chamber. And when he draws me into the chamber, I start to experience, if, I, if my focus is on him, I start experiencing more of his love. That's what she says here. Then verse 9, uh, we're just doing some revision. Verse 9, she says, I have compared thee, O my love, to a company of horses in Pharaoh's chariots. Talking about her, talking about the believer. Uh, Okay, let me, sorry. Where am I? 14, eh? We're fighting here, right. To a company of horses in Pharaoh's chariot. And we said last week that that company of horses talks about the mare. And I explained, I gave you the Hebrew words that shows us that she talk, he talks here about her faith. That her faith have captured in war and, and in a relationship with him, has captured 
certain bounty from the enemy. Okay. Because of her faith, because of the way that she was looking at the circumstances and at what was happening in her life, because of her eye of faith that has been opened, which talks about the mare or the horse of faith, because the way that the Lord has opened her eyes, uh, she saw him in the midst of that, and because of that, the enemy and his plans were dismantled, and it became a profitable circumstance for her, because in that she kept it, captured uh, uh, a chariot, meaning a uh, bounty. What is it? So it's good to get Wait. Yeah, but what's that in English? Wait. Bounty. All right. Bounty. Right. Bounty. Right. Verse 15. Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Thou art dove's eyes. Now, I think this is where we should start, actually. Is that right? That way we ended last time. Right. He says here, Behold, thou art fair. Right. He uses the word fair there twice. My love. I'm just writing down the few words that we could uh, have a look at to understand what uh, she's saying here. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast dove's eyes. Dove's. Let me just put there an eye, just to remind us to get to the key points here. Behold, thou art fair. He says, behold. It means, he says, the Lord says, and he speaks to, this, but to the believer and he says, you know what? What I see in your life is visible. It has become visible. I see things that has been worked in you, which has become visible. Therefore, he says, behold. What does he, what does he say? What needs to be behold or to be, to be beheld? He says, a fairness. And that word fair is the word yafa. Yafa. Ya. Yafa. The pictographic Hebrew. Yut. Ofe uh, and hey Yafa. Why do we write the Hebrew name or the Hebrew word down? So that we don't need to have any human interpretation of what God is saying. We just look at the Furiant Lachana, that which God gives us by this, uh, the word that He uses there. And what we see here, this talks about the tongue. The tongue, our words, our reasoning, which affects eventually, if you look at the mouth there, which eventually affects your prayers. Your reasoning affects your prayers. Did you realize, did you realize that? The way we reason affects our prayers. So he says here, your mouth has become fair. That word fair is beautiful. So he says, her, speak, her speech, her words, her reasoning has been captured. Have a look here what I'm doing. Has been captured. By Ya. Yud. Hey. Singular, so two broiki. Our gesprek, our woorden, our tongue is vastgevang door Yud, Hey. Ya. Is the name of God. Umfolded. Do you see? Okay. That's what makes her fair. That's what makes her beautiful. You know, whatever you say from your mouth, either is beautiful or ugly. 
it either affects people positively or it, it, it uh, repels people. And the more with God, we know the book of James talk a lot about the tongue. So he says here, behold, I can see it has become visible that your tongue is under control of my nature, my character. That you are controlling your character. All right. My love, the word love that he uses here, my love, this word love that he uses here, is the word raya. Raya. Now do we spell that word raya? Rej. Ayen. Yud. And hey, Resh, the pictographic, Ayen, Yud, and hey. You know, if you if you start understanding the Word of God, you will see. Th- it consists of checks and balances. You cannot, you can eat it for bandai drug, but it is all coupled with a, with a, um, uh, do we use spelling in the kinders, with the blocks in the drug? Legos, like Legos. We've just explained Raf, uh, fair now. Rafa. The next word has a check and a balance. Raya. Raya. We see here once again, talks about eyesight, it talks about reason, and we see here once again the name of God. Yeah. Right. So he says, because you see and you reason, you see God. In your circumstances, you see him in everything. You see his presence in everything. And in your reasoning, that is what happens in your reasoning as well. That is what makes you fair. That is what makes us fair. That will make us fair. That will cause our fairness to grow. That will cause that we will not absorb all his light that is shone, shone upon us, but that we will reflect more of his light. Right. That's wonderful. By uh, Now, when we talk about God's light, if we put it, do it this way, when we talk about God's light, Previously, I showed you that the tabernacle of, of Moses fits into the four corners here. With the brazen altar here, the laver, the golden altar. Here we find the table of showbread. Here we find the Ark of the Covenant. And here we find the candlestick. So in each corner we find the four corners of the tabernacle, which is laid out in the form of a cross. Okay. Here at the table of showbread, we find God as our bread. Bread. Here at the candlestick, we find him as our light. We find his light. Here at the, 
at the, very, uh, at the golden altar, we find him as life. So life, light and life, a light, love, and life. It's a synonym. There are, what's synonym in English? Synonyms. Talks about God. So when we talk about love, you can replace the word love with his light or his life. Okay. So, because... No. All right. So, that becomes another study, just to, to have a look at that. Now, when we say here, Raya is what makes her fair, because that's why Paul says, in everything give thanks. Because Paul, what Paul is actually saying is, uh, people, it, you must see God in everything. Forget about the devils and the demons and uh, whatever is present. God is present as well. Focus on God. Exalt Him. Thank Him. And that way you will get spiritual uh, victory. Right. So when he says here, have a look here, what I'm writing here. The ayen. The construction of that, of that letter, Ayen, I've said that previously and I always say that, consists out of a Zayen plus an enlarged Yud. That's what the Hebrew scholars say. So the Ayen consists out of Zayen, which talks about the truth, if you look there, and the Yud, the Yud, the Yud, talks about God's all presence. God is everywhere, like an atom. Is present like an atom is present in all matter. Okay, so what does she see? She sees the truth. What is the truth? The truth is that God is. That is the definition of truth. God is. Okay. I, I, I sometimes I use all these things to try and uh, introduce conversations with people. I will just start, stop a conversation and say, tell me what is, what is truth. We're talking about now about things. Tell me what is truth. And then some people start, they're not sure what is truth. But what they are talking about uh, supposes that they are talking the truth. So truth First of all, let's start there then in our conversation. Truth is that God is. So he's present here. That is truth. That's just the beginning of truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, so, wherever you are in your circumstance, whatever situation you are in, stop yourself and say, what is truth now for me? Yeah, that this one did that, and I've lost this, and... I'm heart sore because of what this one has done and that. Okay. Those things come and go. Truth is something that has always been. Okay. That is what we must start seeing. We must grow in our eyesight. We need that vision. That's why Paul, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 to verse 19, he says to the Ephesian church, I pray that your eyes of your understanding be enlightened. He says that to Christians. He says that to born-again Christians in Ephesus. He says that there's a problem with your eyesight. You need your eyesight to be rectified. Okay. Right. He says there in verse 15, he says, You are fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. He says that twice. Want hy wil die punt. Hy wil die spijker verder inslaan. Hy wil die punt baie goed maak. Dat het baie duidelik is en sigbaar geraak het van hoe sy geestelik gegroe het. Thou has doves eyes. Now that word doves, I challenge you, just go to your Strong's Concordance and have a look at the word doves. 
That were, were doves. The word that I've written down here, that was doves. We'll take you to the word wine. Ayen. Take you to the word ayen. Or yayen, not ayen, yayen. Ya. Yen. Yut, yut. And. Uh, yayen. That's what that word dove means. So God definitely is not talking here about physical characteristics. He's talking about spiritual things here when he speaks to her and when he speaks to us. He doesn't look to, uh, at us at our, at our physical eyes. He looks to us at our spiritual, he looks to our spiritual eyes and he defines what he sees that has been developed and the yut, yut, talks about sparks. You know the spark that has put the life in your engine, in your body? That spark is yut. It is God. Some time ago, I visited somebody that was on his deathbed. He was a physician, uh, uh, um, a physicus, a physicist. Very, very, very intelligent man. But very foolish. Because he refused the Lord. But I was there. And I was standing there in the corridor waiting to be allowed to see him in the intensive care. So I read about the heart there. And they said there on that placard, that medical placard, that they can explain how the heart works and everything, everything, everything. But where the electricity comes from to get that heart, to jumpstart that heart, to get it going. You can, have, you can have everything, a complete, perfect, healthy heart, but they need something invisible to get it start going. That is called youth. Whether you believe in him or whether you don't believe in him, it's irrelevant. If you are living at this moment, it's because his spark of life is there. It puts the light in this building that has put the lights on. He has put the main switch on. And there's a time that he will put the main switch off. And then you need to constrain you. The verdeelend, what you have made, when you live, what he has given, his life. It's not your life. It's his life. Okay. So he says, you've got dove's eyes. He says, your eyes, we've learned, that eyes, if you look at that study there, eyes refer to faith. That's what we've been studying the last few weeks, for weeks, for weeks, for weeks now. Eyes talks about faith. So he says, your faith and your, uh, your, the way that you look at things and your circumstances is affected by wine, is intoxicated. Because the way that you look at things is uh, from out of, an, uh, out of a sight that has been intoxicated by his wine. Now we know that when, you, when people are intoxicated by alcohol, you can see it in their eyes. Everything, the whole system is under control of, of, of the wine, the alcohol that they've got in. The question is this morning, do you have some alcohol, God's alcohol, in your veins? Because we need that type of alcohol in our veins so that it can affect all of our senses, so that we experience everything different to, to those that are sober, that are not under the intoxication of God's love. So that spark of life Okay, says comes from alcohol. And where does the alcohol in our system come from? Where can we find alcohol? How can we, uh, how can we have alcohol and more alcohol in our system? Through surrenders. Because alcohol comes from grape. In those days, they used grapes. 
the grapes were squeezed and uh, crushed. Grapes needed to be crushed so they can ferment. They will not ferment easy if they're not crushed. And grapes, the vine, talks about surrender. Not what I think. A vine needs support. A vine needs to grow on a trellis. It talks about surrender. So the branches of a vine, a slop, a lamut, op a stalasi groei. So God comes to you and he asks of you certain surrenders in the situation that you're in. In a specific corner of situations that you're in. He asks of you certain surrenders. If you surrender, then the, the uh, vine of surrender grows. And the vine of surrender will eventually flower and bring forth grapes. Then the grapes become ripe. Then, they are, then he, because he is the husbandman, he picks the grapes when they are ripe. So your surrenders, your work harvest, come here to full it. You must surrender your work harvest mark, and work harvest mark, and work harvest mark, and a sicker situation, to the year is in your work harvest is not ripe, you have to do it. It's not good, it's not bitter and sour. You know, that's how our surrender starts. Have you ever eaten a sour grape? Our grandchildren come here because they're always in a hurry to get uh, the grapes when they started becoming uh, ripe. So they come and say to me, the grapes are still sour. So there's some grapes in our lives that if you would pick them, they are still sour. You, you still, you don't surrender them so easily, but you know that you need to surrender them. Okay. So when that grape is picked, uh, and bruised, it is pushed down, literally, into a container and kept there until it starts fermenting. Because the sugar in the grape because, uh, start becoming to, uh, start to ferment and uh, grape sugar is turned into alcohol. Right. So your surrenders, eventually, as you make surrenders, as you go through the day and through time, you make different surrenders, small surrenders, great surrenders, and they are, they are put down. They are, uh, when the grapes are ri uh, ripe, they are picked, God picks them, and they are put, pushed down into your being. You hear truths, and you surrender truths to, uh, to, uh, to the Lord, and that is pushed down. And then that, that um, surrenders and truths start Jumping, start moving, start fermenting, start developing into alcohol. We had a look, uh, we know a person that, that brews with blitz. Mampur. Brews, brews his own alcohol. And I've looked now, what's now? Ask questions of how do you get that to become alcohol, and how do you brew it? Because that is how God works in us. Okay, and then when the, the they know that there is the alcohol has been the sugar has been turned into alcohol. When you really look into the container, and you see the contents turning, they move. They get life into it. Literally moves. Okay. So that is what God says. He says, you've got dove's eyes. It means that the way that you look at everything and all things is being affected by the intoxication of the alcohol that is in your blood as a bride, as his bride. And therefore, you, uh, it makes you fair. It makes you his bride. It makes you... A representative of the king, an ambassador. Okay, so the look in her eyes, when he looks at her eyes, does, is not a look of sadness, despondency, desperateness, fear. We've seen Christians with uh, eyes of fear in this time of COVID. 
But I couldn't believe what I see in, in, in believers' eyes. Fear. Where's the wine? Where's the intoxication? Amen. Where's the trust? If you don't have it, you don't have it. You can only have it if you have the alcohol in your veins. And you alone can brew your own alcohol. Through your surrenders to the truth and your surrenders of self before him. Right, 1 verse 16. Behold, thou art fair, my love, yea, pleasant, also our bed is green. So here he compliments her once again for her fairness, repeating what you've just said. And uh, he says here in verse 17, Behold, once again he says it is visible. I see something visible worked in your, in your eyes. Because they are, uh, behold, they are fair, uh, beloved. Yea, pleasant. Also our bed is green. Right. So how many Christians can we even look at and say, you know, you are pleasant. You are somebody that's pleasant. Many Christians are just pleasant when they receive things. And when things go well, then they are pleasant. If things don't go well in human terms, then they are unpleasant. They are somebody that you don't want to live near to. They become Die woord moerig is een goeie woord hier so, want die, in die, in die houwer waar die alcohol gemaakt word, is die moer, die doppe, van die drijwe. Die moer, en wat is die ander woord dat we gebruik? Want die woord is moer. Oké. Okay. Right. Uh, pleasant. Pleasant, in the Hebrew is the word naim. Nun, Ayen, and Mem. Nun, Ayen, Mem. Pleasant, because we all thou art pleasant. And the reason why I'm writing the Hebrew down here, I, I try and not to do it as uh, much because it might tire you. But the reason why I'm writing it down is you can see it. Once again, it talks about eyesight. The way that you look at your situation, the way that we look at things, the way that we look at the sad things that comes to you and the struggles that comes to you and the conflicts that comes to you and the uh, whatever. Good things that come to us. I am pleasant. Okay? So here he says, uh, and as once again, as I said just now, that remember that this ayen is constructed by the word or the letter zayen plus the enlarged yud. So he says, what, what, where does the pleasantness come from? Because her eye is upon the truth, the zayen, the truth, and the fact that God is present in all things. It is very eenvoudig. And I do it oor and oor and oor and oor, want I get it now. It is good. I don't get it later on. Okay. Pleasant. Where does the pleasantness come from? Because her eyes. On the truth. What is the truth? God is in the midst. God is present. That's what the uh, youth talks about. And, right, what is the noon? Just to, net om het verder, die spijker verder op die kop te slaan. What is the noon? A noon consists out, out of a zayen that is been bowed in humility. That's where that, that comes from. Actually, a yen, a zayen that is bowed. All right, let me explain. When you give this type of teaching, people think, ah, now I've got the truth, 
and I can do, and I can speak with force. No, if the truth doesn't bend you, and you do not allow the truth to work humility in you, you are worse than a devil. That's where the fear, or not the fear, that's where the danger comes from being uh, of knowing Hebrew and not knowing the great Hebrew, Amen. the person, the man, the Savior, Yeshua, Moshiach. So yes, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, all of them knew that. All of them knew this. But, because they didn't bend under the truth, they used it as a, something to boast about. They didn't allow the truth to bend them in their own self, in their own esteem. Truth can become a monster. Right. So, uh, so many times we hear Christians, as we speak to Christians, and Christians come to speak to us, we many times we have Christians that, uh, that say, sorry, I've got the type of personality or background uh, and the way I've been raised, I cannot be pleasant. Just sorry, you must just accept that. And my husband have to accept it, that I'm sometimes murach, I'm sometimes not pleasant, and sometimes I'm better. All right, let's just think about scriptures. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. He says, Jesus said there, be ye perfect, because I am perfect. So what Jesus said there, the way that he puts it, he puts it in a command. He says, I don't give you the option. I'm telling you, be ye perfect, for I am perfect. Amen. Now what does that word perfect there mean in, in, Hebrew, in uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 48? What does that word perfect mean? That word perfect is the word What's that? Okay. Right. I'm not going to write the Hebrew down for you, but what I'm going to say is, Quatza means, that word perfect, be ye perfect, for I am perfect. That word perfect talks about, uh, uh, it means the word extremity. It refers to the fourth corner. That is the extreme corner, the, the fourth corner. Fourth corner, one, two, three, four, the fourth corner. Uh, the fourth corner, and it means rest of Shabbat. And it means separate. So what does the Lord say to me? He says to me, forget about all your excuses and the background that you come from and the way that you were raised and uh, your personality that has developed the way he did, he did and your background or whatever, forget about that. Be ye perfect, for I am perfect. So he says, start entering into me, with me, with a covenant relationship and start growing up in your relationship with me and as you do that, your personality becomes my character more and more. That's how my character grows in you. That's how you become pleasant. So none of us has, has an excuse. So what he says, he says all of us grow up into the fourth in, into entering into the fourth covenant with me. Because you see, the three, four, when there was a marriage, a wedding, the guests and all the family and the bride and the bridegroom had to, uh, uh, had to go through the three covenants. It was only the bride and the bridegroom that went through the fourth covenant. It continued. Okay, so Jesus said, every one of us has got the potential Every one of us has got the potential to grow up into being the bride, into a bridal relationship, as we've explained. Yes, here you are saved, there you are saved, here you are saved, and here you are saved, but we need 
to progress and grow in that relationship. Okay. Then he said there that your bed, the, uh, pleasant, uh, also our bed is green. Bed talks about rest. Or what do you do upon a bed? Rest. You Shabbat. You understand Shabbat? Shabbat is when you put your whole body, all the weight of your body upon your bed. I remember that when we were on the border at one stage, we tried, I tried to build myself a bed. I was so sick and tired of being in the sand because it's sand, a lot of sand all the time. And when it rains, the mud comes into you and so on. So well, a few of us had, had plans, so we made bed this, beds this high from the, from the ground. But then you, 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 you use saplings and stuff, and when you, when you lie down, the one sapling bends more than the other, so your one leg goes further down than the other one. And when you turn around, so it didn't work. Eventually you break up everything, you throw it out, you say, no, it doesn't work. Just lay down, give your the whole lie, your whole, your whole weight on the sand, that's your bed, surrender. So when we completely surrender, it means every inch of our being we lay and put into his arms, and in trusting in, in his character. Not resting and trusting that he's going to perform our income, that our outcome that we have in our mind. He's not going to do and perform our outcome. We may ask him, Lord, may the outcome be this, but then rest in whatever he decides the outcome to be. Right, so that bed. He said my bed is green. That's why... I did this just now. We said here is where you find orange. We do another color. Here we find orange. Orange is a mixture of red and yellow. Mixture of yellow and blue is green. You see the word of God is like a um, puzzle. If you have a few, if you have the picture on the box, it's easy to do the puzzle. And none of us has got the full picture on the box. You find puzzle here and there, and then, then you see these fit. Ah, right. Then it seems to be, look like the picture that you find in the Word of God. So green. He says our bed, uh, he says there, our bed, our bed is green. So, rest. When will, we, when will we find rest? Green rest, green. When you've grown in your covenant relationships. You come to a place where you have loyalty towards him. And where you start controlling your thoughts. That's what the, the Ark of the Covenant talks about. That's what the inheritance talk about. That talks about uh, when he starts ruling your mind. Because we said, blue talks about kingship, rulership. Remember? Okay. So when we come there, And the reflection of the white light of God that is shining upon us starts becoming green, so to speak. It means that you start resting and trusting in him. Green, if you look at the dictionary, green refers to tranquility. We've learned that in, in psychology. It brings peace. Tranquility, uh, tranquility, tranquility, and it talks about health. You've heard about the greenies. It talks about the people that are health orientated. If you want to talk about real greeny health, that's where you need to go. All right, and it talks about jealousy. When you start become jealous of what you allow in your mind and what not, if you start allowing just the truth, and and use your mind to focus on Him and to speak the truth in your mind, and to ex expel all other thoughts of hatred, 
and unforgiveness and what people are not doing and what people are doing and what people owe you, what people don't owe you. You put, expel all of that you, because you become jealous on how, uh, what you occupy your mind with. Then your mind be starts becoming absorbing his white light and, and repel, uh, uh, reflecting his green peace. In such a way that he says here, behold, it becomes visible that God has worked something in your life because the peace has become obvious. You don't need to tell somebody that, oh, I'm very peaceful about this, I've got rest. Here, as I for you say, I get, I for three years, rechtig, and here is a for me, and you know, I is. Heer, het recht iets mee gedoen van mijn geloof en vertrouwen in die Heer. Geef me zin in. Je is nog op je pad. Je hebt nog, je moet nog, wie je hier, je nou geïnst kan denken. Ga dan met je oorgaan alles. Je moet niet, je moet niet veroordeel. Je gaat dan met je oorgaan alles. Je gaat nog daar komen, maar niet waar niet. Oké. Okay. Right. Verse 17. As we said, we are skipping and jumping where it refers just to uh, with love. Uh, we've been doing verse 15, verse 16, talking about, uh, we did verse uh, 16 because he continues explaining the word fair there as well, which we found in verse 15, and we're going to continue with, with verse 17 because uh, all of those verses there reflects and speaks about the same type of, of character that he's seeing in her life. He talks here about the... He says there, um, the beams of our house are cedar and our rafters are fir. Our house, do you see he says our house? It means that he lives there and she lives there. It is not her house. Remember, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. It doesn't belong to you. It is his house. And he wants to refer to your being and my being as being his house. Our house. Okay, the beams of our house... I'm going to write the key words here, beams of our house is what? See them. See them. Right, let's just have a look at it. The house. Now, we've been referring to the word house quite often the last few months because the word house refers to a mentality. You live in your own house. You create your own mentality. You, the way that you are reasoning and thinking about things is the house in which you live. Amen. And the good news is that people can change their place of habitation. House is the word of habitation. It is the habit of how you think about things, how you interpret things, and how you investigate things. If you do it according to truth, if you use truth as your main tool, then you will find that you, will, you are building God's house. Your house doesn't become one big cathedral of bats and dragons and ghosts, but your house becomes the house of God. So he says, beams, the beams of our house are cedar. Now that word beams, what does the word beams talk about here? You cannot imagine what that word beams talk about. That word beams talks about threshing place. Threshing place, the place of trotting out thoughts and ideas. Trading out. All right, so remember, the key word here is house. Talks about your mind. Your mind. So he says, because you are trading out the thoughts 
and the reasonings in your mind. Because of the way that you're treading it out, every thought and every reasoning in your mind. Because of that, it has become my house, our house. Because you are treading out all the kaf and the strooi that you think. Is he bezig om uit te trap soos op een dorsvloer? En jy raak ontslaaf van die kaf. Want ek en jy dink baie keer kaf. Nonsens. Pwak. Ons dink nie volgens die waarheid nie. Ons dink nie volgens die beginsels van die koninkryk van God nie. Ons dink van die ander kant af. Ons dink die verkeerde kant af. Ons dink krom. En al hoe dit sy huis en sy tempel word, is wanneer ek a habit, as die woord house is, when it becomes a habit in me, to think according to his way of thinking, and I tread out all the wood, hay, and the stubble, that I have in my mind, and I separate that, from the place where I live, he says, therefore the beams of my house are cedar, that word cedar, let me spell it to you, cedar, I live, Resh, and Zayen. I live, Resh, and Zayen. Arras. The word cedar, aras. A-R-A-Z, if you want to spell it in English. So what does a cedar talk about? My wife and I, uh, me have been talking about the, word, the cedar trees. A cedar is trees that become very, 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 very old. Very old trees. Because, why? Because they've got a very powerful root system. Now, where would you say lies the root system of a Christian? I don't want opinions, okay? We want specific reflections of the truth. Have a look at the, just at the, for instance, at the tabernacle. Mosaic tabernacle. Can you let's see for now? The mosaic tabernacle. <coughs> There's a picture of a man standing there. Where's the roots? Down. Right. Where do we see the feet there? At the brazen altar. Our root system lies in repentance. In the blood of Yeshua Moshiach, the Lamb. That remains to be our root system. The moment that the tree forgets his root system, he's dead. Amen. He's a goner. He dries up. He shrivels up and he becomes wood for the fire. Amen. So the root system is very important. It lies in two, if you see there, the stature has two very important roots. The blood and the fire. Because the blood would mean nothing without the fire. The sacrifice consisted out of the blood put on the altar and then the fire came to, to um, devour consume the sacrifice. Only when the fire came was the, uh, the sacrifice accepted. Okay, so the root system of a Christian, if it's uh, as it a uitgebreide wortelstelsel, a powerful root system, it means that he lives and moves whatever the weather may be, dark and gloomy, thunders, Rainstorms, sunlight, very hot uh, sun, sunshine, doesn't matter. All the time he is repenting and forgiving and uh, laying down self. The word says, you know when the fire, when did the fire fall? When Moses took out his box of matches? When it was an acceptable sacrifice. And when is it acceptable? When I mean, when I mean what I say. I see the effect of what I've been doing. I don't necessarily feel 
sorry about it, but I come and say, Lord, I see what it does. I see what it does to your name. I see what it has done. It makes, it makes uh, destruction. My sin make, does destruction to your name and to your kingdom. I see it and I forgive. I ask you to forgive me. I'm sorry. I want to be sorry. Many times I say to God, I'm not really sorry. To be real, I'm not sorry. But I can see what it, the effect that it has. And I can see it, it uh, destroys your image. And that, for that reason, I'm repenting and I'm asking you to make me sorry, that I'm, I really feel sorry. Okay, so that is a fir tree. So the beams of our house, the beam of my whole being, my whole mentality, my health, my mental health. There are departments of mental health these days. In my days, we could study a degree in mental health. Today, I'm giving you a PhD on mental health. Amen. Mental health is the way you think Amen. as a habit. The ways that you think always needs to be changed in, in other areas in our lives and needs to be fixed on a, a, a cedar root system, blood and fire of the Holy Ghost. And our rafters of fur. Sorry, let me just continue. Cedar. Let me just continue that word. Cedar. You can see a cedar root system always focuses on God's sovereignty. God is sovereign in all things. It affects the reasoning, controls the reasoning, and it's all about the truth. Just to, just to bring down the point. That's a cedar. Okay. Now, uh, cedar wood was used for building material. So if you, we're talking about building a house, which is you and me, our mental health, our spiritual health. It talks about building material. It signifies, the dictionary says, royal power and wealth. So a cedar tree, the ancient people, if they look at a cedar tree, they say it, you know what? It signifies royal power. And wealth. And it symbolizes growth and strength. So this, I thought, I'm, 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 we, we are exp, uh, reading here about mental health. And the remark that I make, I've considered much, and that is, the mental health, of the general Christian today is bad. Amen. Mental health among Christians today is intoxicated. Amen. It's not healthy. Okay. So I'm talking about us, not about other people, I'm talking about us. He says there, and rafters of fur. Rafters. Rafters of, of fur. Right. What is the rafter? In the Hebrew that word rafter means gutters, troughs, channels. Troa, gete, and kanale. For what? Remember, we're talking about our house. For what? Now, we that were in the army knew, when we were out uh, very far, we had to make our shelters in a way where you always build a, a system. You make a hole in the ground, you put your raincoat in there, so the roof of your little um, shelter uh, uh, casts or what's the word? Lay, cast the water so they may all fall into that little reservoir of yours when it rains. So you can have water. She knows that as well. She has burned, she has built gutters 
and troughs and channels full of water. Now, 2 Timothy 3.16, you can write down, says all scripture, it's Paul writing that, all scripture is profitable for doctrine, for what not, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be truly furnished unto all good works. Right. So she learned that she needs every detail and every drop of God's teachings because she needs to gather every detail and every drop of God's teaching for, first of all, for her own thirst to be quenched so that she can cleanse herself. So that she can have water in her labor so she can see herself in the labor. And fourthly, so that she can water her garden. I don't know whether you've ever experienced the preciousness of water. I have. Every drop of water. When you start measuring water in drops. That's when you've really come to the place where water has become precious. Now, let me just uh, amplify what we've been saying. Let's go to Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28. Working against time here. Isaiah 28, verse 9 to 13. We're definitely not going to study that. I'm just referring to you, you, you to one or two principles there. Whom shall he teach knowledge? Isaiah 28, verse 9 to 13. The prophet says, To whom shall God teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Then that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. So do you know whom, to whom will he then teach doctrine? Of knowledge, first of all, knowledge and doctrine, Torah. Second, uh, sorry, Isaiah 28, verse 9, up to verse 13. Now let me just tell you, saints, I wens ek kan het vir die hele Christen wereld sê, en dit is kut, dat hulle tan het laat. Want ons besef nie waarmee is ons bezig nie. He says here, to, uh, whom shall he teach knowledge? That word teach, in the Hebrew, means home. So he says, how will we teach people to build their home in which they live? To build this temple that God says that we are. How is this temple built? Mental health, how is it attained? Through teaching, he answers himself. A house is only built through teaching. Not nice sermons, through teaching. Details, detail of the word. As I said just now, and I'll back it up through the, by the word of God, every drop that falls must be channeled through the gutter system, through the rafters, into cisterns and stored to quench her own, to quench so she can quench her own thirst, so she can cleanse herself, so there can be water in a labor, because the labor in the Old Testament tabernacle was there for the priest to see the reflection of his own face, and to water her garden. Why do Christians' gardens look as they do, spiritually speaking? Because they haven't got water to water their gardens. Because they do not accept, they don't want teaching. They don't want the detail. They want just the fluffy things. Therefore, they've got no rafters 
on their, on their house roofs, rafters, gutters, channels. He says there, uh, to whom shall he teach knowledge? Now we know that knowledge, which we get here in the third corner here, when we study those, uh, those uh, themes, knowledge here that we get in the third corner, knowledge means knowledge by seeing. To know by seeing. So he says, how can we teach knowledge that you will seize? Not knowing like in the Greek understanding of knowing, ek weet van, maar ek sien, soos wat jy wis kunne, uh, uh, en nou wis kunne probleem kyk, jy sien dit, ek sien dit, soos jy dit sien, maar, uh, die man waar het raar verstaan, sien rechtig. Hy sien, die selle, om te sien. And that word knowledge is the word da'at, it's the word yada, that we've studied here, which is spelled yud, the Dalet and Ayen, once again, Ayen, seen. By seen. Now let's just have a look here at the word doctrine. Let's go to De Deuteronomy 32. Let's see. I'm going to talk about it. Because of what I'm talking about. Deuteronomy 32, verse 2. This is in closing that we're making a few remarks here because I see time is running out. Deuteronomy 32, verse 2. My doctrine. Now he said in the previous scripture that we read, whom will he teach doctrine? Now we want to know doctrine. How does it come? My doctrine shall drop as the rain. Drop. as the rain. My speech shall distill, distill, as the dew. As the small rain under the tender, tender of small rain. And as the showers upon the grass. Do you see why rafters is needed? See why gutters is needed? mentality and a mental house is constructed out of a specific root system like the seed is a foundation. And a roof consists out of these gutters and channels that pick up any rain, any form of doctrine. Doctrine God sometimes sends to us, sends to us as dew. Sometimes he sends it to us as rain. Motrian. Here is Motrian, small rain. Take it as a fine rain, Kiza. And sometimes it's showers. God is teaching us. How much of what he teaches us just fall into the sand? And we miss what God is teaching us. God is a great teacher. He's teaching us all the time. As you walk through the garden, as you go through life, as you walk in the corridors that you work, as we drive, His teaching is there all the time. Are we building rafters? Picking up. There are places in this, on this planet where it is so dry that the roof tops of Houses are built in such a way that when the mist comes, the mist distills and it runs in gutters into containers, systems, underground. 
That word teach means a home. Remember, I said just now in Deuteronomy, in Isaiah 28, I forgot to continue on it. Let me just go back for a moment. That word teach, in Isaiah 28, verse 9, that word teach means a home, a house. It means detail. It means pasture, habitation, and a pleasant place. That's where the word pastor comes from, a pastor. I believe there's a teaching going around that you get a pastor and then you get a teacher. A pastor is the one that sits next to everybody's bed when they are sick and visiting people and then a teacher is somebody else. Where in the world do they get that rubbish from? A pastor is a teacher. That's the word teach. It means pastor. A pastor is supposed to give pasture. That's where the word pasture comes from, to give pasture. What does a pastor do? What does a pastor do that gives pasture? Yesterday, one of the sheep died because the pastor didn't know what was wrong with the sheep. But I was there. I knew that there was something wrong with the sheep. I told her. Okay, so... That's important. Right, that word, uh, doctrine. It says it's, all right, we said, it's like a drop of rain, distills like you, small rain, and showers. Then he says there, uh, 32 verse 2. Sorry, it was there in, uh, I missed it there. In, uh, just keep your place there. Isaiah 28, I forgot to. Ek word so opgewoon, ek sê die tyd jaag my, en ek wil hier nie langer hou, as het as het ons moet, mag nie, moet nie, wil nie, kan nie. Verse 10, in Isaiah 28, verse 10, he says, how does this doctrine come? Come, precept, must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, and there a little. And then from there, we go to Deuteronomy 38 or 32, as we've been doing, verse 2. So, so this rain and dew and showers come as precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. That's why we always say, come every Sunday, because... Every teaching builds upon the other. Here you get a little bit of doctrine. Here you get doctrine. Here you get doctrine. There you get, there you get. And eventually the picture becomes clearer to, to us. You'll never get the same teaching here. Never. I mean, here's a, a biblia. A, a, a bibliotheque. That's where the word Bible comes from. A whole library of books. And we're not, we, can't, we don't even scratch the surface. We don't even understand a bit of it. The little bit that we do understand is so phenomenal that we can never, never uh, deplete it in a lifetime. In thousands of years. Right. So it's rafters. And then he says there, uh, uh, Sorry, I guess now here. Let's go back to Song of Solomon. I'm in a flat spin now. Beams of the house are cedar and our rafters are fir. fir. The rafters are fir. That word fir. That word fir. Fir is a very elastic type of wood. They used fir to make the lances for war. A lance, a spice, the staff van die spice, le van fur gemaakt. Because it's elastic, it doesn't explode on impact, it doesn't break into splinters. It's elastic. It was used to make musical instruments with. So we see the character that has been worked 
in her house of habit. One that is elastic, it means it bends and surrenders and bows in humility, not in resistance to the truth, but bows to the truth. And it equips her further on for war and for battle, for the lances that she would need. And it equips her to make of her a musical instrument. Because the bride, and I don't know where the people get it from, but anyway, a warrior in the kingdom of God, let's say, the warrior in the kingdom of God is the bride. The bride is a warrior. That's what makes her. That is the, that is the, when we talk here, about her, about her wedding dress. If we study about the wedding dress, you will see it is a, it is a dress of uh, uh, a, uh, a coat of arms. A coat of arms. This wedding and white dreading, uh, wedding dress is a coat of arms. Coat of arms all of the spirit world. All. So you have to spook and to sweat and to nis and to care to go to the moon and the devil's aandacht to get nie, want hulle, sy kry hulle nie hulle aandacht nie. Hulle het haar self net, het sy haar self net uitput. Maar werkelijke, die gelovige die, die gewaad dra van die bruid en die, en die wit licht weer kaats, dan deins alles weg. Right. I think. You know, this can become a very, this is a very intensive study because every detail explains to us that the relationship that God wants us to grow in. And he explains it in uh, in symbolic terms. It definitely doesn't talk about a natural relationship. I mean, it's obvious. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for explaining to us in so much detail the detail of the relationship that you want to work in our lives. When we look into your labor of your word, we realize that there's so much that we need to grow in. So many instances that we need to trust in you. Where our eyes need to be open to see you and you only. Lord, so that we can be ready when the rapture comes because your word says that those that expect you will see you. It's only when we exercise our eyesight in these circumstances that you explain to us that we will be able to see you and to be caught up in the rapture. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the way that you speak to us. Thank you for your great sacrifice. In the name of your son, Yeshua HaMoshiach, Jesus Christ.